And now the voice didn't say that we're recording, but we're recording. So good evening, everybody, friends and neighbors in Clinton. My name is Joyce Tomaselli, and I'm with Cornell Cooperative Extension, Dutchess County. I run the community horticulture programs there. And um, yeah, if everyone will, everyone's muting, great, thank you. So we've got two presentations um, that are specific to invasive species. And this one is going to a little bit set the stage on invasive species, just to remind folks what the proper definitions are and a little bit about the prioritization that's done regionally. And then tonight I'm going to go through th four things, an insect, a plant, a, um, a disease, and an arthropod. And they're of special new concern, and they're a little frustrating because right now there's not a whole lot we can do about them besides be knowledgeable and help people understand how not to spread them. And then a month or so from now, I've forgotten exactly when, I'm going to um, give a presentation about managing invasives in your own landscape. And this was a, a presentation I made um, earlier this year for a pretty big audience. And I used my own land and the things that I've done right and done wrong. So it's kind of fun to make the points of managing and how to manage and some of the tools for managing. And so we're gonna be talking about that um, on next time. And um, so I am going to start sharing and start the presentation. and hope that you can't hear the dogs barking. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Um, pictured here, we have uh, two pests, a disease and an arthropod. So to set the stage on invasive species, there are um, there's a very specific definition that I wanted to remind us about. It can be plants, it can be pests, it can be diseases, it can be animals like um, hogs, wild hogs that have, have, um, have escaped. But the point is, is that they're introduced into an area where they are not normally um, um, existent. And so they thrive because often they don't have their natural pred predators. Um, maybe they are kept in... in um, in check with diseases where they naturally occur. And also a lot of times they are, are more robust. A lot of the plants that are now invasive were brought in from like geography, geology, like Northern China, Eastern, Eastern Asia, because they were bigger and better. The wisteria, the bittersweet. There was a whole wave of horticulture practices in the mid 1800s to the early 1900s that brought plants over ornamentally, and then they ended up um, 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 out competing what would have um, occurred natively. And the third thing is, is they cause harm. And so there are some weeds that we have which are annoying. There are some flies that are annoying, but when they're introduced and they thrive and then cause harm, that's when they're um, um, deemed to be invasive and that's where um, practices are put in place to manage them. That's where we try and teach people about them, um, to recognize them, to not spread them, to not introduce them. Um, invasive plants are among the top causes of biodiversity loss across the globe. And when you look at a, a heat map of New York, we have the dubious distinction of having some of the highest incidences of invasive species because of our ports, because of our tourism, because of our railroads, because of our canal system. There are some aquatics that are spreading through the canal systems in middle New York and coming from the Great Lakes over to the Hudson River. So um, New York has a, has a lot of these. In the region, which is um, Dutchess, Putnam, Westchester, half of Ulster, either mountains or not mountains, um, uh, um, Orange and Rockland, there is a system that is um, in use that decides what invasive species to target. And some of them are so widespread, we're not gonna do anything about Phragmites anymore. It's, it's everywhere. Um, we're not gonna do a lot about Japanese stiltgrass. It's spread by mowers everywhere, right? But sometimes if there are places in one place in the region that have moved, not moved to the other, they become a target species. And um, 
this ones that we'll be looking today are emerging species where we're really trying to control them before they become a tier three or a tier four. And so there's a lot of science into it. There's a lot of data that goes into it. And um, you can find more or I can point you to more if you're interested. The lower prism also provides a lot of really good information about control um, for about 50 different species, especially plants and insects. Um, there are manual controls, cultural controls, and then if there are any pesticide controls available to most people, they get included. So what we're looking to at tonight is the is is four things that are newish. And sadly, they're becoming more prevalent and you'll understand why, and you'll understand why we're concerned about them. And I can't go do that because of that. So spotted lanternfly has been in the news a lot. And it's especially in the news to the south of us because it's especially prevalent to the south of us. It was introduced, it was first found in 2014 in Berks County, um, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. And lately, they realized that it was probably there a year or two before because what they found was a um, thriving population. And you'll see how it's spread since then. Um, this picture of spotted lanternfly, I call a, a graphic artist's um, dream because you're rarely ever going to see it looking like that, but it looks really cool when you when you use it in pictures because it's big and it's bright and it's it's spotted and it's not a fly and it doesn't light up in the dark. But this is what you often see the picture of. This is what it looks like when it's in its first little stages. The first instar or stage is about the size of a big dog tick. And then when it gets too big for that skeleton, it splits that external skeleton and it grows and it grows and it grows and then it becomes this adult. The adult looks a lot like a moth. It's actually a leaf hopper. This is not part of the, of the pest. This is a grape tendril. Okay, but this is what they look like in general, and you can see by how they stand that they are more of a hopping um, insect, and they're not very good flyers. They can fly. Um, they're very clumsy flyers. They sort of flutter and then bang into things, and and then walk a little bit and flutter and bang into things. Um, it started in, in, in Pennsylvania in 2014, and now a couple of years ago, more breeding populations were confirmed in many places near us, and I'll show you in a, a map in a minute. As of last autumn, the only place that was found in Duchess was an egg mass on a tree on Main Street in Beacon. But now the, the eggs that um, were laid last year are hatching, the pest is growing and feeding. It's in the adult stage. It is laying eggs now. And that's what we have as a problem. I'll explain those eggs in just a moment. So what we've been trying to do is make people aware about this pest, um, how to find it, how to identify it, because there is some research going on that would maybe help control the pest um, and I'll tell you about that. And so we're trying to really spread the awareness and help people understand not to spread the pest. And what we've been doing this summer is we've been building a core of volunteers that go in places where spotted lanternfly might be predicted or might be probable they look for its favorite host tree of heaven and report that and then they report absence or presence of spotted lanternfly and i think adrian you're one of the people that has been out looking for this pest and and mapping it and this helps scientists understand where it is or isn't or where it could be so they can um, send people out if there's a new infestation and what we talked about, um, we talked to almost 700 people at the fair, and I've been talking to a lot of libraries and garden clubs, is we've been trying to make people understand that if they're in an area where there's an infestation, they've got to be really careful about not transporting it. The pattern of finding it by highways and railroads was noticed several years ago, and it continues to be the most prevalent place that this pest is found. And that's because its eggs spread on cars and trucks. It's um, adult, it spreads on cars and trucks. 
people are moving it through transportation. This is the um, this is the most recent map. Whoops, I got to do this a second. I'm trying to get. Oh, I can get rid of that. Cool. Um, so this keeps getting updated, and if you, I have another set of slides where I show it growing. But it started here, and it has been growing in concentric circles every year to the point where all of these blue counties is where there are infestations. And all of the red lines is where there are quarantines that have been created such that if you're creating anything within that quarantine, like forest products or like cider or beer or anything, and you're transporting it out of that quarantine area, you have to have paperwork and education that shows that you're not knowingly transporting it. So these quarantines have gotten huge in the last couple of years. This is the Route 80 corridor. This in Indiana turned out to be a farm that moved from New Jersey and it was on their farm equipment. I don't know the story, but this is outside of Detroit. And there is a, um, there was a press release about six weeks ago that in California, the um, agriculture inspection station found egg masses on an 18 wheeler full of firewood from New Jersey. This is the close up for New York. And this is where infestations have been found around us. And sadly in Dutchess County now they have, found, they have been found in Arlington, Poughkeepsie. They have been found in Pauling. They have been found near the Connecticut border. And I'm confident that we're gonna find more as we're looking for more. Um, in Westchester and Connecticut here, for, for two years it was right at the airport and it has crossed the border into Westchester that's probably parked cars. Um, in Orange County, it's at, it was first found at um, park and rides and at throughway um, rest areas. In Ithaca, it was found where there's a parking lot for a popular camping site. Um, in Putnam, um, was that Westchester? It was, it was south of Newburgh. I'm getting my counties mixed up, but there's a really nice um, a reservation that has a lot of visitors and it was found at the parking lot there. So this was updated a month ago and it is already out of date. The good news is that there are some studies that show that two naturally occurring fungus, fungal pathogens have been thought, have been found to have killed um, adults and the, the nymphs, and um, they are native, and one of them is already an ingredient in some approved biopesticides, bio and so that means that the um, approvals to make it available, excuse me, will be able to be um, accomplished much more quickly than if it was a brand new something that had never been researched before. And what they're finding is with, with um, big cannons, water cannons, they're, they're spraying huge trees and they're finding a, lo a lot of um, efficacy on killing it. So there could be good news coming down the road. What it is, is it's a plant hopper and it feeds on about seven different species of plants, of shrubs and trees. And its favorite host is Tree of Heaven, which I'll describe in just a moment. Our really big concern here in the Hudson Valley is that it really likes grapes and it likes hops and it likes orchard trees. And the problem with grapes, I believe I'll ex explain in just a moment, but it's not only an economic loss, but it's an agrotourism loss because those are the areas that people like to come in and visit. And um, they're not gonna be really pleased if they visit and find these pests crawling all over what they want to buy, which is the grapes for the wine or the hops for the beer, etc. What it does is it robs the plant of its nutrients in the sap after the nutrients went up the tree and or shrub and the plant photosynthesized, the nutrients come back down to the roots and these steal that sap they steal the nutrients they want, and then they exude, they discard the honeydew, the sugars, and those sugars that are discarded cause a black sooty mold to grow. 
So they're weakening the trees or vines, and then they're adding an ick factor because now there's this sticky black sooty mold all over everything. Um, it has a very specific um, um, merged mandible which is shown right here, which the older it gets, the stronger it gets. And so it starts on very tender little plants and then it moves up into trees. And we have found in autumn when the trees sap has stopped um, moving because the tree has gone dormant, they go back to grapevines because the grapevines are still um, viable for them to, to feed on. They're only about the size of the end of your finger. They're not huge. Um, but they do form big masses. And so the older they get, the more gregarious they are and the more they form really obvious uh, congregations. There's only one um, life's one cycle a year. So they hatch the first time we saw them. Um, they're, they're, um, they're on the other side of the um, walkway over Hudson, walkway over the Hudson um, on the rail trail there. And I went and I found some in June and I went back and found some in July. I found this red one, which was surprisingly big, like the size of your, of your pinky fingernail and then um, the adults. And so they start laying eggs and they can continue to lay eggs. They lay a couple of different clutches of eggs until hard frost and those eggs then overwinter and, and, and um, hatch in spring. The egg masses um, are not very obvious. They lay their series of eggs of, of 30 or 40 or 50 eggs, and then they cover it with sort of a putty-like substance, and that substance ages as it gets into the winter. And this is an aged egg mass um, shown on the bark of its favorite tree, which is Ilanthus altissima, tree of heaven. So it, it, it blends in really easy. And they do like to lay um, eggs on almost any hard surface, including rusty metal, which is why we see it um, um, spreading where we have transportation trucks and trains and cars. So they can move three or four miles on their own. They're not very good flyers. It helps if there's wind. Um, the big rain events, the storms that we had last summer, a lot were washed up from New Jersey to Long Island because of the winds and that added infestations on Long Island. Um, but the problem is, is that people move them and um, they can move them almost, almost anywhere. And um, if they, park the truck or it, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's left standing, they can hatch wherever that is. Or if they move the adults, the adults can lay eggs almost, any, lay eggs almost anywhere on, on, on big trees. There is a really good checklist that um, maybe Barb, you can remind me when I send you the recording link, I'll also send you a checklist because it's a really simple way to remind yourself what this thing can move on. So with spotted lanternfly, this is the deal. And it's late in the season now. So we're not gonna see that much here. Next year, we're very concerned about it. Its favorite tree is Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven was introduced as a ornamental, isn't this cool, big and different tree in the 1830s. And it is now growing everywhere in North America, except the center of like Montana and the Dakotas where it's too cold. Tree of Heaven and American Beach, and we're gonna talk about a beach disease in a minute, so pay attention to both, are the only trees that we have that as adults, big old trees, they're the only ones that have smooth bark. Young trees have smooth bark, but big old trees with smooth bark are either tree of heaven or American beach. So the citizen scientists that we're asking to go out and scout, when they walk along a road or they drive along a road, well, hopefully walking, not driving, and they see a big tree with a smooth bark, they stop and look more closely. Looking at the tree more closely, you can use bark any time of year to identify beach or tree of heaven. And those are the two that are circled here. Tree of heaven also, both of these trees 
when you find the adult, you tend to find other saplings around it because both of them spread by seed, but both of them also spread by root sprouting. So when you see that smooth bark, you look for little saplings. And this is an example of the, the leaf scar that's very um, identifiable for Tree of Heaven. And then you can look more closely at the leaves that are at your eye level. You can look for the spotted lanternfly, or you can look for beech leaf disease, which, which I'll describe in a moment. When we identify any tree, we look at its twig arrangement, at its leaves type, at its leaf margin, and at its fruit. Tree of Heaven is a compound leaf. So it has lots of leaflets, but when it falls off in, in, in autumn, the bud is back here. So it, it's compound. And um, that's the first thing that you see. The second thing is it's the only tree that grows here with compound leaves that has this little bump, this little lobe at the bottom of every single leaf. And when you look at it under a micro, even but with a naked eye, you can see that it's a little round thing. And when you squish it, it stinks. Okay, because that's a little gland that's there. And so when you see the big tree and you look at something close up, it's pretty easy to see what it is. The fruit look a lot like a maple seed. They're called Samaras. The, um, the flowers are very pretty. They're white. Um, the, um, the, the Samaras start out green in spring. They turn a really nice orange this time of year. And then they turn a, a papery light brown in winter. This is showing you how a mature tree of heaven makes um, saplings. And I've gotten good enough at it um, where I can drive down a road. I mean, every day I drive from Salt Point on Hollow Road and I can see where mature tree of heaven trees were cut down several years ago. And now there's an entire half mile of saplings because they sprouted from the roots. This is where Tree of Heaven is found, and this is all our major um, highways. It's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere where there's disturbed soil. It's everywhere where there's good sun, and it's all along our roads and all railroads. Um, beach has a simple leaf, and it has a um, um, serrated margin. And it has veins that are pretty simple to see. So if I go back to see how, how it has a different look altogether, where this is smooth, where the veins curve, and this is compound. So this is a very different leaf. It's a different fruit. In winter, beech tends to keep its leaves on. Um, on young trees, it's thought that that helps the deer to not browse it so they can grow up and get bigger and they won't have their buds um, uh, eaten off. And when you're good, you can look and you can see this little, um, this little bud, it's called an awl. I keep losing my cursor. Where's my cursor? Well, I've lost my cursor. So tree of heaven and beach are pretty easy to identify. And when we identify tree of heaven, then we can look for spotted lantern fly. When we identify beach, now what we're concerned about is the third thing I'm talking about today, which is beach leaf disease. And where tree of heaven is introduced and invasive and everywhere, beach is a native and it's huge old trees. They love um, along, along, um, ravines, they love to be along creeks, they love to be in forests where it's cool. They also thrive as ornamentals. If you look at any cemetery, if you look at any historical site, if you look at wonderful old trees on Garfield Place, you're going to see beech trees because they're beautiful, huge old trees. The problem here is that this is a disease that affects both the leaves that leafed out this year and the buds that are formed this year for next year. And 
what happens is it starts thinning the lower part of the tree and then it moves up the tree. And trees can survive defoliation for a couple of, of years, but if it's killing this year's leaf and next year's bud, that's a double whammy. And it is killing young beech trees quite quickly. And it's killing some old established trees also very quickly. And the scientists don't agree yet what is causing this. They have found that wherever they have beech leaf disease, they're finding nematodes. And nematodes are an unusual thing, it's not an insect, it's a tiny thing, who is smaller than the diameter of a human hair. Sometimes they spread diseases, sometimes they're beneficial. And although they have found nematodes wherever there's this disease, they have not found disease wherever there are nematodes on beach. And they're still trying to figure it out. So um, until we know consistently what the cause is, you can't know what to do about it. And this can be spread. We're not sure why, but one of the things is it may be being spread by people. We worry that when hikers go through forests and don't clean their boots and they hike somewhere else, that may be something that's spreading it. There, are other, there might be other things that's spreading it. So these are three um, pictures. This is 2019, so two, three years ago. And it was first discovered in Ohio. Some scientists were taking a hike and they said something's weird with these beech trees. And within a few years, as the blue gets darker, it started spreading around Lake Erie it started spreading more around Lake Erie and then it hopped to Lake Ontario and it hopped to the Long Island Sound, right? And everyone's saying, wait a minute, in, in seven years, how is this spreading? And why is it spreading around water? And no, no one knows yet. So this is 2020 with the purple, 2020, and it's spreading lots more. And this horribly is 2021. It's been reported, I think, in 26 counties in New York. And it's really bad west of 84. It's bad in Westchester. It's bad in um, Rockland. And it has been found in Dutchess County by the Connecticut border. And it's been found in a, um, in a large area in the Poughkeepsie vicinity. It's also been found in a park along the Hudson River. So um, these are the same things that we're asking citizen scientists to go and scout for and look for these and be aware of them because we don't know why it spreads and we don't know how, how, to, how to treat it. So um, this is a microscopic photo of a nematode. This is um, when it was first confirmed in Long Island. Uh, this, is the, this is the Cornell Research Station there, Marjorie Doherty. This is what it looks like up front. And I went to the site in Poughkeepsie and used my snow brush to reach up a tree to pull down a leaf. And it's really weird. Um, you get very dark um, 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 coloration that as the season progresses gets really weird and leathery. And like I said, it starts further down in the canopy and, and moves its way up. And you see it, you look up and at some, you look when the sun's shining through and it almost looks like you're just seeing a shadow of one leaf crossing the other. But then when you look closely, you see this individual stuff on each leaf. Here's more, it's called banding. Here's the, um, here's how things get sparse because it's, it's damaging the leaves so much. There are a few other um, beech leaves that look similar. So whenever someone says they've got beech leaf disease or suspect it, um, they can bring me a sample or I can get samples up to the, um, the lab. And we've gotten pretty good at seeing what's other beech diseases or what what's is beech leaf disease. 
something called a uranium patch caused by mites, but they they make more of a sunken ridge. They don't go um, they don't go um, uh, uh, through the entire through the entire vein. So talked about spotted lanternfly and then ilanthus, and then we talked about ilanthus and beech, and then. What we want to do is when we see Ilanthus, we want to look for spotted lanternfly. And when we see beech, we want to look for beech leaf disease. And then the final thing that I'm going to talk about tonight, and then I'll take questions on everything, is jumping worms. So I think we've all been taught that worms are good, right? I mean, worms are good. Worms are in the soil. Worms are... Uh, um, they, they, they have wonderful um, mycorrhizal um, um, affinity. They, 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 they have um, wonderful uh, abilities in the, in the soil to, to mix things around and, and, and um, you know, loosen it up and, and make it more loamy. Um, they improve the water holding capacity because they make places for air pockets. And so you get a spongier structure. And I think everyone knows that worms are good. Well, not necessarily. Darwin said worms were good, but Darwin was looking, um, did a lot of his work on European earthworms and um, found a lot of good information about European earthworms. And if you're curious, you can read this treatise from 1881. You can find photocopies of it online, which my husband got for me for me to read on the beach. But um, all worms aren't good. There are different worms in the ecosystem and they have different names and they have different um, functions or um, capabilities. And the, um, I don't think I have the slide. There are no or few native earthworms in New York because the glacial activity got rid of most of them, okay? It was too cold. Some are moving in a little bit, but many, most of the worms we have were introduced um, maybe inadvertently when people um, migrated from Europe, maybe um, deliberately. But the European earthworms that we know of as good worms and that Darwin spent a lot of time um, studying are called anisic. And they are quite deep in the soil. They're large. Um, they make um, a bunch of different um, burrows. And European earthworms like to stay down when it's too cold. They stay down when it's too hot and they live several years. When they come up, they make a little bit of casting or middens, and Darwin did all sorts of studying of them, but they're not very obvious, okay? Um, they do come out in spring and fall when it rains because it makes the rain, makes it easier for them to move, okay? So European earthworms are introduced, but they've not gotten to the point where they cause harm, and so they're not considered to be invasive. There's some epigeic um, little worms that tend to be lighter. Um, sometimes they are um, um, the larvae of insects, um, but they tend to be right at the top, and they tend to be pretty small, and they tend to be pretty cool about um, helping decompose the leaf debris. And then finally, there's endogeic, which are um, sort of in this middle area. And they, they have sort of have branching um, 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 burrows. The problem we have is with jumping worms, they're a combination of this epigeic and endogeic. And they live just under the surface and they really rapidly consume the all of the material, the organic material in the top, top few inches of soil and in the litter, the leaf litter of a forest. Okay. And once they hatch in spring, they stay at this layer all the time. So when people try and um, 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 identify jumping worms, one of the things you think about is how hot is it? Because if it's hot, the earthworm went back down. Okay. Okay, so jumping worms, uh, there are three that have been found here. There are more that are categorized as jumping worms, but in the Northeast, we're finding three that are coexisting. So what they're doing and where they're causing harm is especially in forests. 
And a lot of the um, research on jumping worms came out of the states that are around the Great Lakes, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio, because that's where they were first really discovered. And they were probably introduced by and spread by fishermen as bait. Okay. Um, grasslands, that's maybe a, a, a misun, a typo, it's not really a typo, it's being too vague on my point. There are a concern in managed turf like golf courses because they can really rapidly um, um, destroy the turf that is so carefully, lovingly, maniacally um, managed when you've got a golf course. There's not a whole lot of concern with agriculture. I think it's because it tends to be plowed and because the plants that are growing in that land tend to be pretty quick, they grow pretty quickly. In our home landscapes, they're also a huge problem, a concern in our gardens because they destroy the soil in the first couple of inches. So when we use mulches, when we have a forest leaf litter, they're really decaying it very quickly. And the castings that they produce, their waste, are really high pH, they're highly eros erodible, and it's very hard for woodland ephemeral plants to grow in those because um, it's high pH and you get a lot of nutrient runoff. So that goes back to the concern with forests. The worms reproduce very rapidly. There's a couple of generations a year. They can lay 30 to 50 cocoons with two to three eggs inside each cocoon and they're parthenogenetic. They don't need to mate. So once they're established, there's an exponential growth possible. The cocoons survive to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, negative. So the worms get killed with our winter but the cocoons overwinter. And that's where we have, we have the, the concern. Um, night crawlers have those deep vertical burrows that I told you about. When you bother them, they tend to exude a mucus and so they're slimy. And they have a, a, a clitellum that's, that's called, it's a band that's raised. When they move, they have a little thing called cilia on the bottom of each segment, and so they can only move this way, all right? And when they come out of their burrows, they don't make a lot of unusually looking, they don't make a lot of castings that look weird. And they're most visible in spring and fall and after rain. On the other hand, jumping worms are at the top of the soil. Their skin is very shiny. And as they get older, they almost look fluorescent. Um, you get really weird, um, iridescent is the word I meant, iridescent. You, you get a shiny um, pink, greeny, blue color to them. Um, the clitellum is, is even with it. And on each segment, they have those cilia all the way around. So they, they not only move this way, but they can flop around and that's why they get their name jumping, okay? And when where they're active, they, they show very visible soil disturbance. And they get big by late June and they're very big until, and visible until hard frost. They're both dark, they're both large in summer. So, oh, I wonder if this will work. I don't know how to move this and start the video. Oh, here we go. I wonder if I have good enough bandwidth. So that was where I picked um, jumping worms out of my raspberry patch raised beds where I think I moved them in with four, um, uh, compost that I brought in and I dumped them into that pail. And the ne next day I went out and they were still out there and they weren't dead yet. So I put them in a black plastic bag and I solarized them. This is a picture of those worm castings. And this is my hand in October of that year where I was digging out some dahlia tubers and that's a handful of jumping worms and they're disgusting. Sorry about the dog. Um, this is their coons. They're very small and it's really hard to see, but this is in demonstration gardens at the, at the Farm and Home Center and the castings there were three inches deep. 
So they're spread by people too. People spread them when they buy soil or compost that has the cocoons. They can spread them when they buy plants from a garden store that has the cocoons. They can spread them with soil on trees, on their hiking boots, in sharing plants. That's why we don't share plants. We don't dig plants for our plant sale anymore. We buy everything from um, commercial greenhouses that grow them from sterile media, not in ground or bare root so that we're not spreading them. The worms themselves can spread about 10 meters a year. I've watched them spread down my driveway because it goes down to the creek and in rainstorms, they very nicely spread down. And then I have found them as they've, as they've, as they've spread. Um, so they're prohibited as a New York prohibited invasive species. You're not allowed to buy them, but sometimes people do sell them and it, it, is, um, it is thought to be spread by fishing bait and then maybe some careless dumping of those. These are what the, um, this is a picture from the Keeleys when um, these, these um, egg masses up here, when they had just been laid and they had not um, hardened and turned brown yet. And this, um, we first um, discovered them in New York this time in 2017. And we asked people, citizen sciences, scientists to map them. And you can see that they're spreading throughout New York. We don't see a lot up in the Adirondacks yet. The hope is it's too cold. And I carefully said we discovered them this time because as people go back in literature, they were perhaps referred to at the Bronx Zoo when the platypus were introduced because they brought worms which were fed to them. We find that there are articles about finding weird worms in um, florist moss that had been imported. We think that they may have come when the cherry trees were donated to Washington DC from Japan. And I've talked to old fishermen that say that they knew not to use these worms when they were kids because they broke on the, on the hook and fish didn't like them as much. So we found them this time, but they may have been around longer. So, that's what I had, and then I'd be very happy to take lots of questions. We're concerned about these new invasives, and we're concerned about the spotted lanternfly. It's a plant hopper. It feeds on a lot of plants. It's established, and now we're finding it more and more in New York. Let me go back to the grapevines for a moment, too. What Pennsylvania is finding and Cornell um, venologists are working in the Finger Lakes and in the Hudson Valley. They're finding that when this insect is little, it's feeding on the young grape growth. As it gets bigger, it goes to its favorite tree, Ilanthus. And then when the um, trees start going dormant, it goes back to grapes. Trees can take defoliation a couple of years in a row and trees can lose um, nutrition through sap. But grapevines, if you think about it, they're pruned every year to have the trunk and a few adult arms and then they have a lot of new growth. So when the, the pest first feeds on the grapevines, it goes to Ilanthus and then it comes back again. It's weakening that vine over and over again. And there have been vineyards that have been destroyed in Pennsylvania in as little as, as three to five years. So it's a bad thing. And, and we're really um, working hard to make sure it doesn't spread and then helping um, vineyards or municipalities or others areas understand what it is they can do um, if they find it, how to treat it. Beech leaf disease is um, spreading rapidly. Jumping worms are spreading rapidly. And this is why it's sort of a depressing lecture because there's not a whole lot that we can do about it other than touch people and get them to report it. There's lots and lots of resources. And that's what I had in terms of the presentation tonight.
And now I would love to look at any questions. Oh, so never, November 10th, thank you, Barb and Leah. That's when I'm presenting to the other presentation. Um, Adrian um, or others, I didn't say the site in Poughkeepsie and um, Adrian, I'll, I'll get back to you or maybe she had to go, but sometimes when something is first discovered, there needs to be a, um, a verification by scientists. And sometimes when something is discovered, it needs to be kept confidential where that is because sometimes public are going to react in a weird way. And so when it's in a park and when it's in a public area, it's not mine to send to share that information. Um, and I looked carefully and I've not seen any public reports about these places. And so I'm not going to share it just because um, it's it's not mine too. Um, but um, anyhow, that is uh, that is uh, where 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 we can go from there. So um, anybody anybody else with questions? Joyce, I have a question. I'm terrified of these jumping worms because they destroy your soil. How do you deal with them in your garden? We don't have any. Um, we don't have anything available for homeowners. Um, what I find is that they are most. They're mostly icky. They're mostly um, damaging to the spring ephemerals in forests, okay. but. Um, when they're in your perennial garden, the roots of the perennials are usually a lot deeper than they go. Okay. When they're in your vegetable garden, the roots of the vegetables are usually a lot deeper than they go. Okay. They're not going to eat your potatoes. They're not going to eat your radishes. They're not going to eat your carrots. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people are doing to be proactive is if they build a raised bed, they'll put, um, hard, they'll put, um, weed cloth on the bottom of that raised bed so that they can't migrate into that soil. Okay. And then they make sure you can solarize the soil so that um, you, you put about three inches of soil, uh, you wet it and you put it under clear plastic and you mm -hmm. let it out in the spring sunshine mm -hmm. and that'll kill anything, right? Okay. And so that'll kill the cocoons. And so you build the raised bed knowing that you haven't introduced any jumping worms. Okay. Um, there were first early on, there were people that were devastated because they bought, you know, a truckload of compost or, yeah. or mulch and they mulched their entire property and they had, they had jumping worms on their entire mm -hmm. property. Again, when it shrubs, it's not a big problem. When they're on a hill, it becomes more erosive. Mm -hmm. So I've been surprised with the, the demonstration gardens at the Farm and Home Center. I don't know if you've seen them. I mean, the jumping worms were rampant two years ago, and most of those things are still fine. Mm -hmm. We didn't have many reported this year because I think it was too hot and too dry. Okay. So when I dig in my garden, what are the worms that I'm seeing in the top two or three inches of soil? Because I don't think I have jumping worms. It depends on when you see them. So if you're seeing them in the midst of summer when it's hot, mm -hmm. then look and see if you're seeing that weird castings soil. Okay. And when you wet it, when you wet it, it's, it's, it's their poop. I mean, it's yeah. not, it's not mineral. It's right. like clay. It's like clay, but it's dark. It feels weird. Okay. Okay. And so if that's what the majority of the soil is and it's hot out, then you've got jumping worms. Okay. You can mix ground mustard um, mm -hmm. with water. You can pour it on. They'll all come to the surface and you can throw them away in a bucket. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Joyce, Al has got a question for you. Um, thank you. So the beech leaf disease and the spotted lantern fly um what do you do if you see them like how so, do you report um, them yeah so right now you you go to imap invasives and um i think in the resources i showed there's um a url and i'll include it in the thing and what you do is you take a picture and you send it in and there are scientists and they have had thousands 
of reports. But there's scientists that look at each photo. If they need to, they go back to the person and they find out where it was found and they go and double check it. So when the first one was reported in Dutchess County, I got a notification that it was there and I went and met the person and we found it together. So they're trying to find first in county. And then also, because it was something that was the first in Duchess, I was able to send samples of beech leaf disease to the scientist in Long Island. And she is a real scientist and she was able to confirm nematodes. So we, you know, we, we get, the community gets together and finds out what's going on. With spotted lanternfly, then DEC, the Department of Environment, um, you know, it's the environmental conservation and um, New York Ag and Markets have staff that go out and they'll put up sticky traps. They'll monitor them. Um, they come and they 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 count. Um, they're showing pictures of, of summer interns with backpack vacuum cleaners, vacuuming all of the little insects where they first find them and killing them to try and make sure that they're not spread. So we get volunteers to help watch and then they go out and do what they can to try and, and, and control it. Would you say that the IMAP, uh, uh, app, that are you familiar with the SEEK app to be able to identify uh, plants and such like that? So the IMAP, is it fairly straightforward to use? It is. Um, when IMAP was first created, we could take down an entire um, server system when we were using it. And um, IMAP app, it comes up on your phone. How am I going to do this so that it sees it? Um, I have too much light. Nope, I'm still, I've got too much light. Is it back? You're not going to be able to see it. IMAP in basics, have it, 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 it comes up on your phone and basically you take a photograph and you answer a couple of questions on what is it you think you found. It sets the GPS pin and you can wait in, until you go home and you've got better bandwidth and then you upload the record. So it's, it's, it's really simple um, and it's, 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 it's received right away. The app is free, it's very fast. It's um, supported by DEC and it's used in Pennsylvania, New York, I think not New Jersey. Great, great, because we're we're all our CAC, which is Al, and we've got Margaret here. Um, we've been using Seek often. <laughs> it's right, and it turns out good. <laughs> it turns out that Seek is part. Seek and iNaturalist are um, linked, and I learned yesterday at the Prism meeting that in previous years, iNaturalist findings were uploaded batch later. Now they're getting uploaded almost every week. So using iNaturalist, reporting spotted lanternfly as an example, gets put into the huge database of IMAP invasives and triggers the scientists verifying it. So they merge those two, deba those two databases. Does that answer your question, Al? You said you found it was not intuitive and you don't know what organization or project you were supposed to be using. Oh, okay. Because I was talking, I, I wasn't reading too. Um, no, no, no. Fine. I'm fine. It was great what you were saying. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd be pleased to set it up for you or set it up for Barb and then she can do the same things. I, because I'm part of the PRISM organization, but that's what we say. But I can, I can help that get updated. The organization just identifies who gets notified. Any person, any person can use IMAP invasives and it will trigger a record with the GPS, with the photo that then is part of the database. Okay. Thank Actually, you. I had a different question. Oh, pardon, sorry. Um, so you said that the spotted lanternfly lays egg masses on cars and stuff how long like how long does your car have to be sitting still for them to park on there for you to um, bring them somewhere you know it could be a half an hour we had master gardeners went down to longwood garden uh two summers ago and they 
they wandered the gardens and when they came back, they looked and they were spotted lantern fly in the windshield wiper area, in the, in the wheel wells, and they can lay an egg mass and then flutter off. Um, the, the, um, one of the infestations in Orange County is at a big box store parking lot and it's surrounded by Ilanthus. And so trucks come, they deliver stuff, trucks leave. So it's, it's really spreading. What is the benefit of the Ilanthus to them? What do they get out of being on that? Um, you know, I've only read briefly. Um, oh, and I'm out of my league now. I think that they are attracted to some chemical compound. Ilanthus is native to where spotted lanternfly are native. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to have it but they prefer it. Right. And um, I just got, I, again, I was at the meeting yesterday and one of the people, there's a, there's a tree called Amur cork tree that a bunch of the um, people are finding is also covered with spotted lanternfly. And I'll be darned, it's from the same native area that spotted mm -hmm. lanternfly is. So there's somehow there's an affinity between the pest and its host. Yeah, they feel right at home, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So when we talk next, we have many more positive things that we can do. And we can be encouraged and lots of homeowners and gardeners can be encouraged. Um, and and one, one, last, one last point on the Atlantis, especially because as a CAC, we're thinking about a municipality. There are some people that call me up and say, okay, identified, I identified Atlantis. Looks like we may have lost her. Next year. Oops, she's gone. There she is. Yes, I got dropped. And so probably, well, that didn't end the recording. The last point on Ilanthus is it is growing everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you cut it down everywhere, it's a huge environmental problem mm -hmm. because it's a tree that's growing and providing shade and photosynthesizing, and it's growing everywhere. I can find it almost anywhere along this conic. Also, if you go to your Ilanthus and you cut it down, all the roots are gonna sprout, mm -hmm. right? So you have to sneak up on it. And PSU, Penn State has a really good um, fact sheet on it where basically you rely on the fact that in autumn now, uh, 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 September, October, November is when plants are bringing all the nutrients they can from their leaves to their roots. You damage, you slash the bark, not enough to think that it's dying, but enough that then you apply a systemic herbicide and it pulls that down into its roots and it kills the roots. And that is something that, you know, if, if in our town of Clinton, if we find, you know, at the town hall or other places where there's some Ilanthus that are adults that we would really rather not have, there are ways that they can be managed. Mm -hmm. But you can't say to the Department of Transportation of New York State, cut down all the Ilanthus along the Taconic. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Froze down. Oh dear. Thank you, Joyce.
Thank you all for being here. Thank you. And um, we have the next presentation on the 10th okay. of November. So I think that's going to be very interesting as well. No, I'm not. I guess I guess she's gone. Joyce, thank you. <laughs> okay. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, Mel. Take care. Good to see you. <laughs>